Welcome to the Becoming You Show with me, your host, Leah Rowling. Do you believe you are capable of choosing your future? Sometimes it takes just one person to believe in you, for you to believe in yourself. If you find yourself continuing to say, someday I will take better care of myself, only to continue living the same day over and over and over again, then you, my friend, are in the right place. I am your biggest cheerleader, inspiring you to become you, on purpose and with intention. Are you ready to create a life you love? I'm excited to share with you some big ideas that you can use today to inspire, impact, and influence your life and everyone in it. The Becoming You Show starts now. Hello, my friends. How are you? I am so excited about um, the upcoming holidays and my retreat that is happening next weekend. It's going to be awesome. We're going to redesign lives and find more time and create more energy and solve for burnout and overwhelm that is preventing us from living into our full potential. And I cannot wait. And if you want to find out more about it, you can head over to my website at www.leahrolling.com. I would love to see you there. Today, so we are going to be talking about a topic that we like to complicate. We like to be confused by what it is and how to do it. And that is the idea of boundaries. So I want to have a conversation with you about what they are and share with you a framework for creating and setting them in your life. So what are boundaries? Boundaries are mental, emotional, and physical limits on what you will and won't tolerate. Boundaries are for you and you only. We think boundaries are for other people. And when they do not uphold them, we get frustrated and think that boundaries don't work. And so then we throw up our hands and then just kind of say, screw it. But boundaries are for us to uphold with the expectation that they most likely will not do what you request of them. Hence, the reason for setting a boundary in the first place. Boundaries are interesting to think about as it relates to children versus adults. At least, at least for me, anyway, they're a little different. With children, it is an expectation, right? And if broken, there is a consequence. We, we also make consequences very complicated, and they're not. A consequence is an accountability conversation with two parts. The first part is they uphold the boundary, the rule, the expectation, and they're positively rewarded, ideally by what the child values. I love asking my kids what they think the reward should be for upholding the rules of the house. Secondly, they don't uphold the boundary. And there is an empowering consequence that usually looks like taking away something the child values. And again, I ask the same question with my kids. If you don't do this, or if you don't do that, what do you think the consequence should be? And lots of time, their consequence is way harder than mine is or would have been. So getting their buy-in for both is super valuable because then they know the rules. They co-created them. And when it comes time to enforce them, you can do it without frustration, without anger, and without overwhelm. So for example, I don't allow swearing in my home. I don't like it when my kids swear. So my boundary is when they do, I suggest to them that since they like that word so much, they can write, I won't say, fill in the blank, swear word, Again, and again, because they love that word so much, they can write it 50 times. And as they got older, it was 75, and now it's 100. So do they swear? Yes, although rarely, at least what I hear. But when they do, they almost, without redirection from me, go into my office, grab a sheet of paper, and they start writing. Similarly, I don't like stuff on the stairway up to their bedroom. So 
when they're a step on the stairs and they have been home and they're in their rooms, which means that they passed whatever has been on the stairs, I will take their phones away. I was just tired of asking them to get whatever was on the stairs. And so that was a boundary for me. That was an emotional boundary for me. It was exhausting to continue to ask them to take things up the stairs. I didn't think I should have to ask. And for the most part, I don't have to anymore because what they've decided is that they would prefer to bend over and take the things up the stairs than to lose their phone. But I don't even have to get mad about it. And so many times, we think we have to enforce boundaries in anger. And I just want to clear up that mess conception right now. I want you to set boundaries in love. I love me. I don't want swearing in my home. And nor do I want a bunch of stuff on the stairs. And I love them. I want to teach them values and tidiness. And I love us. I love our relationship enough to enforce without the backlash from frustration and annoyance. I want to respect everyone and this boundary process. So I expect that they'll swear. That is why I had to set up a consequence in the first place. I expect that they might leave some stuff on the stairs. And again, that is why I have boundaries around it. It's not my kid's job to uphold the boundary. It's mine to enforce it with accountability measures, okay? So you might say, well, that's well and good, but how do you get adults to do what you want them to do? How do you get them to stop doing what you don't want them to? And the answer is simple, is simple. You don't. And I know it's super disappointing, but they, like you, have agency to choose their life, choose what they do, choose what they don't do. But this is the power that you have as well. You get to set up your boundaries. You get to set the rules as it relates to what you will do or not do when it comes to how an adult behaves. So then with adults, then our boundaries become more of a request. So I want you to think about that one person in your life that for whatever reason, you feel like some boundaries might be useful for your mental, your emotional, and your physical well-being. Maybe you've tried setting boundaries before and it didn't work because you had this backwards. You thought that the request should have been upheld. And the only reason the boundary wasn't upheld was because you did not uphold it. So now we know that we are the upholders of the boundaries. So with this person in mind, you probably think that this person is difficult in some way. And as a side, there are not difficult people. Right. This is a whole conversation for another day. But so for today, I will let you have your difficult person. Um, how nice of me, right? But let's start with why it is that they are seemingly difficult. How would they be better for you? What would they start doing, stop doing, so that you could feel however it is that you want to feel? Maybe it's, I wish they would start being more tidy. Or maybe it's, I wish they would stop being so tidy. Maybe it's, I wish they would ask me more about my day, or I would wish that they would talk to me more. Maybe I wish they would talk to me less. Maybe I wish they would stop complaining. Maybe you think that they are lazy and you wish that they would do more around the house. Now, without judgment, what you came up with, I want you to first assess if that is a boundary violation for you. And remember, Upholding boundaries requires some mental and emotional and physical effort. So the question is, would there be a net positive gain in setting one up? Meaning, is the mental, emotional, and physical toll greater or less than the mental, emotional, or physical toll of setting and upholding the boundary? So let's just say your significant other verbally attacks you. Let's say he says, or she says awful, horrible, mean things, and it destroys you mentally, emotionally, and physically. Is dealing with that worse than removing yourself from the situation? For me, it would be yes, absolutely. Setting a boundary and upholding that would be less exhausting in all accounts than saying, you know what? When you talk to me like this, 
I'm just going to remove myself and leave. That is a much less toll on me physically, emotionally than it would be to stay and endure it. Okay, so once you decide what is a boundary violation for you, and when you know, you get to set it up and uphold it. Boundaries are the most honoring thing that we can do for ourselves. So let me take the rest of this time and talk about the four areas where I feel like setting up boundaries are life-changing. I call it my B4 framework because... They're boundaries and there's four of them. So the first one is inputs. Inputs, meaning where are you letting, what are you letting in your mind? What are you letting into your head space is a really important thing to put boundaries around. What are you listening to? Does the music, podcast, shows, TikToks, reels, are they sources of inspiration or desperation? Do they elevate how you show up? Or do they slow you down? Is it empowering like a podcast like this? Or is it cynical and degrading? Even well-intended inputs can create havoc in our life. Think about the news. Is too much too much? Think about the girls' night out. Is it full of hate and stress? Or is it uplifting and thought-provoking? Social media? Every single swipe is judgment in favor or against. And I'm not bashing social media. I love social media. It allows us to connect and to reach far more people than we would have if we didn't have it. But think about every single like, not like, swipe, comment. Do I share? Do I not share? Is an opportunity to judge. And it is an opportunity to compare. And most people are not comparing in abundance, rather in scarcity. And then we feel our judgment, we feel our scarcity, we feel our comparison are not enough, and it is emotionally exhausting. So the test to see if this input is affecting me in a way that is serving or not is just one simple question. Does this input make me want to be the very best of who it is that I can be? Or does it not? If it does, then by all means, let it in. And if it doesn't, you might want to consider putting a boundary or putting some limitations, some rules around, around what inputs you are going to allow in your life. Boundary two, yeses. Yeses, as it relates to what you say yes to. As a recovering people pleaser, my default was always yes. I would say yes to pretty much everything and pretty much everyone. I didn't, I didn't want to make anyone mad. I didn't want to disappoint anyone. I would exhaust myself and literally have no energy for my own care. I found often that everyone got the best of me, except for the people in my life that matter the most, my husband, my kids, my friends. My coach suggested once to me that my immediate reply when asked to do something, to participate in something, to promote something, to speak at something, you name it, was no. Just no. And then I had to defend my yes based on my rules and my qualifiers. So I had to come up with some rules for myself. What are your rules to your yeses? Do you know them? Have you written them down? Have you memorized them? So my rules to my yes are simple. One, will I have a good attitude about it? Will it be fun? Two, will it encourage my growth? Three, will it further my mission in life? If not, it's just a no. It's, I'm sorry. It's, I can't at this time. It's, it doesn't fit in my schedule at this time. I can't add that in my life at this point in time. We have to be crystal clear about a few things. One, for me, if I can't say yes with a good attitude, they deserve someone else. They deserve someone that can say yes with a great attitude, yeah? Secondly, you can't disappoint anyone. We can't. People are responsible for their own disappointment. And when we know this, I mean, really know this, we disappoint ourselves less. 
Every time we say yes against our will, when we want to say no, we disappoint ourselves. And who knows whether or not we really will disappoint them or not. And if we want, this is how I'm transitioning to freedom of the please. This is what I say. I'm getting better at this not being so long-winded, but it's something like this. I say, I don't want you to be disappointed. And I get that by me saying no to this, you may or may not be. But if I say yes to this, I will for sure be because I don't have the bandwidth for this right now in my life. And you deserve somebody that does. And I'm sorry. And if you're mad at me or disappointed with me, I get it. I can be mad and disappointed with me too at times. It's as simple as that. And three, and probably most importantly, if you don't have time for self-care, if you are not cultivating your energy habits, if you don't have time to foster your most important relationships in your life, consider that you shouldn't be saying yes to anything more in it. Third, in this boundary framework, is relationships. Now, I mentioned it at the start, so I won't say much more about it other than you need to know what you will and you will not tolerate from other people. Not by way of praying and hoping that they will change so that you can feel better about them and your life, but so that you can feel better about honoring who it is that you are and what it is that you need. Hear me say this, please. People don't need to be any different for you to be happy for you to feel loved, to feel worthy, to be enough. And if you want your life to be different, to feel different, you have to be different. Changing people won't make you feel better until you do the work to feel better about the people you want to change. And understanding this concept is the secret to bettering your relationships with yourself and everyone else in your life. It is a game changer. Okay, so we talked about boundarying our inputs with what we let in and out of our head. Our yeses, what we say yes to and having some rules around it and our relationships. The last one is that of our hearts. And this is more of an unboundering. Meaning, when I think of boundaries, I think of restrictions, I think of rules, what we will and we will not tolerate, our line in the sand, perhaps. But with our hearts, I want us to free ourselves from the boundary to not feel or to fake feel fine. Can we release the idea that emotions are bad? And drop into the incredible lesson that each and every one of our feelings have something to teach us. Can we sit with disappointment, fear, worry, scared, anger, frustration, resentment, and release that all these feelings that we would typically label as bad are just unmet needs? Unmet needs that only we can meet for ourselves. And when I sit in resentment and I allow myself to be unboundaried to feel all the feelings, all of them, the entire range by not labeling them good or bad. And when I sit in that emotion, what is it teaching me? I I know for me, when I sit in resentment, I realize that I need more self-care for myself. When I sit in frustration, I realize that I'm resisting reality. And there's an opportunity for me to explore what what I need to accept for my own peace. When I'm scared, I realize that I might be on the right track. So what are your emotions telling you about you? What are they trying to tell you? And if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you know that I'm a runner, that that I ran from feeling. My default was fine. And if your default is fine, 
when you're not fine. I'm all about you being fine if it's a true fine. But if you're really listening and you're just offering up a fine when you're actually not fine, consider checking in with yourself. What would it look like to pay attention to your not fine and really listen for the truth? There is so much goodness there to learn about you, the, the magnificent and magical you. I don't want you to miss it. That self-awareness in unboundering your heart and allowing yourself to, to feel the entire range of feeling is available to you. For so many of us, we don't want to feel or we think we are feeling and actually we're resisting. We think that that emotion feels awful. But here's what I want to offer. The emotion itself doesn't feel awful. It's the resistance to it. It's the, the pushing back on not wanting to feel it that feels awful. And unfelt feelings, they fester. And your life will continue to give you opportunities to allow yourself to feel. That is the learning that is required for new doors, new opportunities to open. So if you're wondering, huh, I wonder why there haven't been more doors opening. I wonder why the universe or whatever you believe in hasn't been showing me the way. That next step, consider it's because there's a feeling that needs to be processed. You need to sit with it and understand what it's trying to teach you. So with boundaries, can you put some boundaries on the inputs? What's coming in? What are we allowing ourselves to listen to, to take in? I promise we're either lightening up our head or loading it up. And that is all dependent on what we allow between our ears. Can you boundary your yeses? Can you make sure that every yes is defended by a thousand no's and passes the litmus test of the rules that you create? Not the rules that I create. I would love to know your rules. I would love to know what your rules are with regards to what you say yes to. Because know that what you say yes to will no doubt affect what you're able to do in your life in the way that you want to do it. And I want you to love your reason. Can you boundary your relationships so that you and everyone else gets the best of you? I'm sure you know what relationships offer up that negative input that make you feel however it is that you feel because you can't manage your thoughts around them. And remind yourself, it's not that person that makes you feel that way. It's your thoughts about that person. All valid. I just want you to be on to yourself and set boundaries accordingly. And can you unboundary your heart and be open and willing to feel everything and explore with curiosity what is there for you to learn? If you want help with anything that I teach or, or to take whatever it is that I share with you on these podcasts to that next level, I want to invite you to either one, I know it's short notice, but fly down and, and be with me in Houston for our reset and redesign retreat. If you can't be there for that, we're going to have another one in February. So stay tuned for that. And I'm launching a program in January. We're going to clutter free your mind and your heart and your relationships. We're going to put boundaries on all of this. Your time, 
We're going to really dig in to the career clutter that we create for ourselves by way of dishonoring our purpose, our gifts, our genius. And so if you want to be involved in that program, I want you to go over to my website, get on the wait list. And lastly, if you just want to unpack something with me, share a story with me, pop on a strategy call with me. Again, go over to my website, www.leahrolling.com, contact, hit my Calendly link, find 20 minutes. It's the best gift that you can give yourself by just allowing yourself an opportunity to share and explore what might be going on for you. I say this a lot, but if you have a human brain like we all do, we have blind spots. And just like I will always have a coach because I can't see the blind spots in my head, we can't see the blind spots in our head. And it is the most freeing thing to do to explore what is keeping us stuck, what is blocking us from the success and the progress and the potential that is available to us when we get out of our own head and get out of our own way and open up the doors for that next thing for our life. So I hope you have an incredible rest of your day and weekend. I can't wait to see you next week. Take care, everybody, and we'll, we'll talk soon. Bye. Bye. You have been listening to the Becoming You Show with me, your host, Leah Rowling, where I share big ideas to inspire, impact, and influence your life. Tune in every Friday at 11 Central on TransformationTalkRadio.com for your morning cup of coffee, the hug you never want to end, and that inspirational message that you felt was written just for you. Each show is inspiring you to become you with purpose and intention. For more information or to connect with me, visit www.LeahRowling.com.